This is Almost Forever by David Moody. Immortality? Just taking the piss out of me now. Come on, friend. You know as well as I do. That's just science fiction bullshit. So, what exactly are you talking about? You haven't been listening, have you? I'm not talking about living forever. I'm talking about massively improved cellular efficiency, leading to substantially increased longevity throughout the body. And you still think that's achievable? Still sounds like science fiction to me. Uh, which part of this don't you get? It works. I've already done it. Am I going out on my own tonight? What? I asked if I'm going out on my own, Deanna repeated, sounding less than impressed. Jesus, John, get off your backside and stop staring at the phone. I still didn't move. I couldn't stop thinking about what Morgan had just told me. In the 15 or so years I'd known him, he continually infuriated and inspired me in equal measure. There was no doubt he was brilliant and gifted. And if he said he'd made a groundbreaking discovery which would change medicine forever, that I knew he would almost certainly had. His qualifications and intellect were undoubted. Everything else about him, less so. Back when we'd first met at the university, I'd initially hung around with him because I thought I wanted to be a rebel too. I soon discovered the real reason. Being with Morgan kept me on the straight and narrow. Turned out he was everything I didn't want to be. So what is it this time? I watched Deanna as she sat in front of the mirror, fixing her makeup and hair. She looked stunning, as usual. He says he's made a miracle breakthrough. I eventually, I, I eventually remembered to reply. Another one. As good as his last half-baked scheme? I hesitated. Much as I wanted to deny it, everything he told me made sense. No, it's different this time. I might regret saying this, but I think he might actually be on to something. Deanna got up, snatched her handbag from the dressing table, then breezed out of the room, leaving nothing behind but the smell of her perfume. You're a bloody idiot, she said, her voice fading as she disappeared downstairs. You believe anything he tells you. I followed her out and leaned over the banister. No, Dee, seriously, I really think he's got something. She stood in the hallway, coat half on, staring back up at me. So when are you going? Tomorrow. Morgan's father's house was a couple of miles out of town. Despite his dad having died several years ago, I still found it impossible to think of the large, imposing, and increasingly dilapidated building as belonging to Morgan now. Being a homeowner implied some level of responsibility, and Morgan was regularly the least responsible person I knew. <clears throat> it's about time you arrived, he said, as he opened the door. You were supposed to be here hours ago. Got stuck at work, I said, staring at him. Complications with a patient. Uh, <clears throat> he painfully, his painfully thin torso and arms were a mass of tattoos, so many that I couldn't see where one ended and the next began. That's no way to greet a friend. You do realize you're stuck with those. My dad's dead, pal, he said, grinning. I didn't advertise for a replacement. He looked further into the house. I followed at a cautious distance, picking my way through the carnage. The grubby carpet was tacky beneath the soles of my shoes. Oh, he said, stopping suddenly. If you like the tattoos, you'll love this. He stuck his tongue out at me. The end of it had been split. The two sides twisted over each other as he made shapes with his mouth. There were many things I didn't understand about Morgan. His recent addiction to bizarre body modifications was one of them. What the hell did you have that done for, you bloody idiot? You're going to look stupid when you get old. I can't wait to see it, actually. Saggy old man tits, trousers hitched up to your navel, wrinkly skin, bald head, and all those tattoos. And what have you done to your earlobes? Jesus, I could get my fingers through those holes. You look like one of those Amazonian tribesmen. Brazilian, he said, correcting me, walking away again, handing, heading down the steps to the basement. Anyway, I shouted after him, I was forgetting. You're going to live forever, aren't you? He stopped outside the door to his lab and looked back at me. Not forever, just for a very long time. Morgan sat opposite me in his overgrown back garden, smoking a foul-smelling herbal cigarette. On his lap was a tame gray rat, which curled playfully around his finger as he fussed it. I couldn't take my eyes off the thing. I'd watched him inject it with enough poison to kill a horse, 
less than 90 minutes earlier. For a while it had become lethargic, hissing with pain and appearing on the point of death, but it had slowly recovered, coming around as if it were just waking from a particularly restless sleep. So you're convinced now, then. I looked from the rat to Morgan and back again, desperately trying to find a hole in his theory where to disprove the impossibility. I just witnessed, the impossibility I just witnessed, but I couldn't. Look, he said, suddenly sounding marginally more serious. Uh, there's no bullshit, okay? This is completely on the level. This works. It's because I'm operating on a cellular level that the effects are so dramatic. Like I said on the phone, this isn't immortality. I reckon it might double your projected lifespan, though. I watched him for a while longer, my head swimming with a thousand different thoughts. Morgan looked like a stoner, a dropout, or a roadie for a band, as far from an influential, game-changing genius as you could get. Beneath the cocky facade, though, he was a troubled and lonely soul. We'd been through a lot together, and much as it sometimes pained me to admit, he was like a brother. An annoying, lazy, bad-mannered, but frequently quite brilliant brother. So what are you going to do with this, I asked. The rat scrambled up his open shirt and perched itself on his shoulder. Nothing, he replied. I'm going to keep it to myself for now. But think of the people you could save. And imagine the problems this will cause. Fuck's sake, John. Can't have a world of people living past 150, can we? The planet's overstocked as it is. There's no more room. That's not for you to decide. Actually, it is. My discovery, my rules. You can't create something like this and then keep it to yourself. It's immoral. It's all a bit dubious, whichever way you look at it. He leaned back in his chair and nuzzled the rat, then finished his cigarette and flicked the stub into the bushes. So why did you do it? Because I could. And why did you contact me? If you're intent on keeping this to yourself, why bother telling anyone? He paused before answering. I already suspected what was coming next. I haven't finished yet. I need to try the procedure on a person. I've got a volunteer, but you know what I'm like. I've never been one for official channels and ethics committees and all that bullshit. I still don't understand. I need your help. You're medically trained and you're my closest friend. You're about the only person I still trust. Who else am I going to ask? <clears throat> you should have seen her, John. She looked awful. She was literally having to hold her breath to get it on. And when she finally managed to do it up, there were bulges where there shouldn't have been bulges, and the fastenings were straining. Honestly, she was 20 years too old and several stone too heavy for that dress. It was the most expensive thing in the store, so there was no way she was leaving without it. John, are you even listening to me? What? Hell, what's the point? Did you leave your brain back at Morgan's today? I reached across and grabbed Deanna's hand. Sorry, honey. Got a lot on my mind, that's all. I remember when the only thing on your mind was me, she grumbled. Now I have to compete with whatever bullshit Morgan has been filling your head with. Hell, if you're like this now, how will you be when I'm as old and ugly as Hilda Daniels? Who? You really weren't listening, were you? Hilda Daniels. I was just telling you about her. A gross old crone with loads of cash and no taste. I don't get you. I just forget it, she said angrily, snatching her hand from mine and getting up. Dee, please, I'm sorry. She stood with her back to me, and I cursed my insensitivity. The longer the awkward standoff continued, the more I knew I'd really upset her. And very slowly, she turned back around. I cringed, ready for the torrent of, of abuse I was sure she was about to let fly. Bastard. Sorry. So, she said, unbuttoning her blouse and letting it fall from her shoulders. What exactly do I have to do to get your full attention these days? I was back at Morgan's within the week. I knew little of his volunteer, save for the fact that he had an incurable muscle-wasting disease. He'd been a friend of Morgan's for some time, I understood. The friendship, the friendship would last much longer. Either the disease would finish him off or Morgan would. The two of them were in the kitchen. Morgan's friend was in as unfortunate a condition as I'd expected. Though similar in age to us both, his body appeared unnaturally small. He was wizened and contorted, crammed awkwardly into a high-backed wheelchair. His neck was twisted to one side, his face fixed into a permanent strained grimace. One claw-like hand, the only part of his body over which he seemed to still have any real control, was stretched out, fingers wrapped around the stubby black joystick which operated the chair, holding on for dear life. This is calm. 
Morgan said, putting a reassuring hand on the other man's bony shoulder. Without my treatment, he's fucked. Jesus, Morgan, is this supposed to happen? The emaciated man on the bed in front of me began to violently convulse. As quickly as the horrendous spasm started, they stopped. Morgan checked his vital signs, seemingly unconcerned. He's fine. Phase one of the treatment had begun hours earlier with an initial dose of chemicals, followed by an intense but brief bombardment of radiation. Morgan explained that the irradiated, the irradiated serum had to work its way around his entire body for the procedure to be successful. These convulsions were the first indication that it was almost time for phase two. I stood at the back of the cellar lab, redundant, as Morgan lined up a series of injections. There's only a small window of time to administer the second stage, he said, watching Cole intently. And if he missed that window? And the effects of the first stage med medication will kill him. The room became silent, save for the metronomic bleep bleeping of Combs heart rate monitor. And then I thought it missed a beat, then another. Then an awful, overlong, gut-wrenching gap between one beat and the next. I instinctively moved forward, but Morgan blocked me. He waited a second longer, then sprang into life. He thumped the needles deep into Combs' motionless chest, one after the other in quick succession, then stepped back, and he waited. It felt like forever. It had only been half a minute before the heartbeat trace returned, weak at first, soon stronger and steadier than before. I stayed long enough to be sure that Combs' condition was stable, then went home. I heard nothing more from Morgan for over a week. I'd given up on him, decided that his experiment must have failed when he finally called. I was out with Deanna at the time. We immediately drove there. My uncertainty increased when I rang the doorbell and there was no reply. Listen, she said. I can hear him in the garden. We let ourselves in through the side gate, and there, playing football on the lawn, was Morgan and another man. It took a while before I realized it was Colm, after a while longer for me to fully accept what I was seeing. The pitiful wreck of a man who would have been unable to move without assistance last week was now playing football. He remained painfully thin and occasionally unsteady, but the change in his condition was remarkable. You're bloody good. I'll give you that. I told Morgan that, Morgan that evening as the three of us ate dinner together. Cormac skipped town a short while earlier, leaving his wheelchair and his old life behind. He decided to head off and start over again somewhere no one knew him. Somewhere he'd just be calm, not the man who'd made an impossible recovery from an incurable disease. I always knew I was bloody good, just not that bloody good. I surprised myself. I still can't believe what you've done, Morg, Deanna said. There's honestly no trick or deception, just your treatments. It's that simple, he said, trivializing the scientific breakthrough of the century. It's, it's the ultimate body mod. So what's next? Morgan didn't answer her at first. He chewed thoughtfully. I'm satisfied that Colm's treatment was a complete success, he said. Want to see what effect it has on a healthy subject next? But there's no way you'll find anyone who would, I began to say before he interrupted. I've already started, he said. I've administered the first stage treatment on myself. I couldn't say anything beforehand because I knew you'd refuse. I don't understand. I asked you here to help with Combs so that you'd see the entire procedure. I need you to finish my treatments. You're not serious. Never more so. I won't do it. And that's me screwed, isn't it? What are you saying, Morgan? Deanna asked. I already knew. <clears throat> I'm sorry, mate, there was no other way. You'd never have agreed otherwise. He's blackmailing me, Dee, I explained, getting up and walking away from the table. You're a bastard, Morgan. He shrugged his shoulders and carried on eating, completely unfazed. I still don't understand, Deanna said. If I don't carry out the second phase of the treatment, Morgan will die. What else could I do? I had no option but to help him, but I vowed that would be the extent of my involvement. I watched the life drain from his body. First unconsciousness, next the convulsions, finally cardiac arrest, then sank the syringes into his flesh as I'd seen him do to Colm. Once his heart had restarted, Deanna and I left. That stupid, selfish fucker could look after himself, I decided, leaving his semi-conscious body on the slab in his cellar lab. We heard nothing further from him. Deanna mentioned Morgan frequently. I did all I could to block him from my mind. He'd be all right, I told her. He always was. It was almost two weeks later, in the middle of a vicious summer storm, when he appeared at the door of our house. 
soaked through and clearly not giving a damn. This is incredible, he said as I opened the door. It works, John. It really works. Fuck off. I went, I went to slam the door, but he stuck his hand out and caught it. <clears throat> Morgan, Deanna shouted, pushing past me and wrapping her arms around his scrawny, scruffy frame. She took his hand and led him into the house. I thought you killed yourself, you stupid bastard. Far from it. Honestly, Dee, this is incredible. I mean, I'm not Superman or anything like that, but I feel, what, different? I can't explain. I've never experienced anything like this before. Me neither, I said, taking my wife's hand from his and going through to the living room. Morgan sat down opposite us, soaking the sofa and dripping on the rug. We should all go through this, he continued, babbling excitedly. I'm serious. The three of us should do it. What if I don't want to, I said. What if there are side effects? Christ, Morgan, you could drop dead tomorrow. That's not going to happen, John. Think about it. My body's stronger than it's ever been. Listen, my, I might only have just told you about this, but I've been working on it for years. There are no side effects. I know what I'm doing. My anger toward Morgan slowly subsided. I watched him for weeks, checking him over every couple of days, monitoring his health. And what I saw was remarkable. One afternoon, he cut himself on a jagged piece of metal in his scrap, scrapyard-like garage, slashing the palm of his right hand. It was a deep and vicious cut, and yet incredibly, within a couple of hours, it was healed. I went to change his blood-soaked dressing and discovered that, that the wound had almost completely disappeared. Just a faint red line remained where the flesh had been torn open. I still got to be careful, he told me. If I lost a finger, it wouldn't have grown back. The following day, both Deanna and I were off work. There was much we should have been doing, but we chose to do nothing instead. It was almost midday. We lay in bed together like a pair of teenagers. She climbed on top of me, still naked from the night before. You can't want more, I said. <clears throat> you can't want more, I said, half joking. Bloody hell, Dee, it's only been a couple of hours. Don't you want me anymore? She slid off and lay beside me again, running her hand over my chest. Of course I do. I'm spent, that's all. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're getting old. Maybe I am. Then maybe you should try Morgan's treatment. Don't be stupid. I'm not, she said, sounding offended. I'm serious. It's out of the question. She moved her hand lower. Just imagine it, John, making love all night, every night, forever. And as she disappeared beneath the sheets, it was impossible to argue. I lost a patient. How ill she'd been and how hard my team and I had worked was irrelevant. The fact remained that a 17-year-old girl was dead, her family devastated. I hadn't been able to save her, so I'd struggled to keep her alive. I'd been able to think, and all I'd been able to think about was that fucker Morgan and his damn treatment. Could I really be expected to keep what I'd learned to myself? His discovery, what he seemed to think of as little more than a party trick, could potentially alleviate untold amounts of pain and suffering. I decided to confront Morgan when I next saw him. Didn't have to wait long. He was at the house when I finally got back. What's up with you? Deanna asked. The two of them had been drinking. <clears throat> Bad day, I answered. A patient of mine died. She was only 17. I'm sure you did all you could, she said, sounding less than interested. Don't try and trivialize this, I shouted at her, surprising even myself with my sudden anger. Calm down, John, Morgan said, standing up and moving towards me. I pushed him away. Calm down. For Christ's sake, Morgan, think I've got every right to be a little pissed off, don't you? You're sitting on a discovery that's going to revolutionize medicine forever, but you refuse to share it. If you'd seen what I'd seen today, if you'd been the one who had to tell the girl's parents that their daughter was dead... We've talked about this. You know, I can't just let this out into the public domain. Society can't cope with people living twice as long or even longer. What would you know about society? What are you afraid of, Morgan? Do you think we'll all become selfish, self-obsessed shits like you? Or is it a power thing? Does it make you feel like a god? I stared at him, desperate for the argument to continue, but he didn't answer. I glared at him with his long hair, his stupid bloody patchwork quilt of tattoos covering every visible inch of his skin, those goddamn things in his ears, and the splits in his, the tip of his tongue. You're not a god, I told him. You're a fucking freak. 
Morgan remained infuriatingly calm, picked up his coat. Sorry, Dee, he said, and as he left, squeezing her hand when he passed her, the silence after the front door slammed shut was deafening. You bastard, Deanna said, barely even looking at me. You totally underestimate him. You think, I've been out there trying to save lives today, Dee. What's he been doing? Playing Superman and pissing what's left of his inheritance up the wall, no doubt. You're wrong. He was here tonight because he wanted to talk to you. Have you ever stopped to think he might be struggling with all this, too? He needs your help. You always got you, insensitive prick. He knows the importance of what he's discovered. He can't handle it on his own. Well, he wasn't on his own, was he? I snapped, not thinking. He got you. I tried to apologize, but it was too late. Deanna pushed past me and went up to bed. When I woke next morning, she wasn't there. I drove straight to Morgan's house and hammered on the door until he let me in. Where is she, Morgan? I didn't wait for him to answer. Deanna was in the kitchen, sitting staring out the window. She glanced back over her shoulder at me and then turned away again. What do you want? We need to talk. Morgan needed to talk last night. Come on, Dee. Look, I'm sorry. I was an idiot. It's just that I could have saved that kid yesterday if I'd had, ac if I'd had access to Morgan's treatment. <laughs> I know that, she said, still not facing me. But Morgan's right, isn't he? The world's barely limping along as it is. If he shares the information he's got, we're all screwed. It's an impossible situation, isn't it? Morgan said. I turned around and saw him standing right behind me. Damned if we don't, damned if we do. We? We're all in this together now, John. I'm seeing things from a different perspective than either of you. We need to get back onto a level playing field. What the hell are you talking about? Let me tell him, Morgan. Deanna interrupted, and I felt my legs weaken momentarily. Tell me what? Were they having an affair? In the heat of the moment, that stupidly was all I could think. I want us both to have the treatment, John, she eventually admitted. You can't be serious. Deadly, she said, and it was clear that she was. Thing is, we need time to make sure we handle this properly, and Morgan can give us that. <laughs> no way. <clears throat> but so much more than that, she continued. You're an ass at times, John, but I love you. We've been together for 12 years. They've been 12 incredible years, haven't they? <laughs> the best. So imagine another hundred years like that. The treatment would make that possible. <laughs> Come on, friend, Morgan said. You got nothing to lose and everything to gain. If someone told me I could have a hundred years with someone like Dee, I'd take it in a heartbeat. I knew he was right, and I was about to say as much when Deanna spoke again. Thing is, sweetheart, I've already started my treatment. I took the medication before you arrived. I have to see it through now. When Deanna's reaction began in earnest, I was terrified. She'd been talking normally a short while earlier, but it suddenly sunk into deep unconsciousness. And now she lay in front of me on Morgan's operating table, her body convulsing. Her heart rate traits kept time. I didn't realize how much reassurance the constant noise provided until it stuttered, then stopped. I stepped back as Morgan moved forward, fighting against my, all my instincts to push him out of the way and resuscitate her myself. He held back for what felt like forever, then plunged the syringes into her naked body and waited for her to reanimate. Every second felt like an hour. Morgan, is this... Sometimes takes a little longer, he hissed defensively. Just wait. And then, finally, the heart rate monitor began to bleep steadily again. I leaned back against the wall with relief. See, he said, I told you it would be. He stopped speaking instantly when the noise of the machine turned to a sudden, high-pitched whine. I reached out for Deanna, but he blocked my way. Her body's rejecting it, he screamed. On the bed in front of me, my wife's naked body began to convulse. Her spine arched as I fought to get closer, and then she dropped back down hard like a piece of meat on a butcher's counter. No noise, no movement, absolute silence. I shoved Morgan away and tried to resuscitate her, my head spinning, my hands numb with shock. I refused to give up, even when I knew she was gone and there was no hope. Morgan pulled me away from Deanna. I collapsed in the corner of the room, barely able to breathe. She was dead. My reason for living was gone. Morgan had taken everything from me. I needed him to feel my pain. I anesthetized him while he was sleeping and took him back down to his lab where I operated. The various procedures took hours to complete, 
We had plenty of time. I kept him sedated for a day to ensure he made a suitable recovery. It was remarkable. Anyone else would have taken many weeks. In less than 24 hours, all his wounds had healed. I strapped him to a chair while I sealed the cellar door with the three of us inside. I blocked it with as much equipment as I could and sat down and waited for him to come around. He tried to move, but he couldn't. Don't panic, Morgan, I said. You're safe. We're in your lab. He tried to move again. Please don't struggle because it won't do you any good. You've taken my life from me, Morgan. Now I've taken yours. He shuffled on the seat and I stared at what was left of him, him in the low light. His bare but colorfully inked skin, his long hair, his bloody holes in his earlobes, the stumps. I need you to try and understand what you've done to me. You're a selfish fucker, so I don't expect you'll grasp the whole enormity of the hurt you've caused straight away. To a man with plenty of time now, I've done what I can to give you the perfect conditions in which to reflect. What remained of Morgan gave a little shudder. I hope you don't mind. I made a few body modifications of my own just to help keep you focused. You'd be amazed if you could see what I've done to you. Except, of course, you can't because I've taken out your eyes. And that split tongue of yours? Gone too. Didn't want you shouting for help when you could, should be thinking. The biggest change is your arms and legs. I've amputated them. Like you said once, nothing's going to grow back. Everything seems to have healed nicely. The bizarrely decorated torso twitched and fought against its bonds, then slumped forward with resignation. I got up and lay down on the bed next to Deanna. I held her body tight as I injected myself with enough drugs to finish me. The door is sealed. I doubt anyone will come looking down here for a long time. I'm going to end my life now, Morgan. See, I still have the power to do that. You, on the other hand, are stuck here forever with nothing to do but think about what you've done. Well, almost forever.